Vice President, Council Members, and Participants, we are now live. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, we will shortly be reconvening this morning's hearing. I want to thank you all for agreeing to stay with us. Um, we're going to receive, resume our public hearing uh, this afternoon. Um, we will have the Department of Aviation and we will have the Department of Fleet Services. And our first witness to testify in this afternoon's hearing is Mr. McDermott, you froze. Looks like your screen okay. froze. We will have Shelly Cameron, the Chief Executive Officer of the Philadelphia International. <laughs> Mr. McDermott's screen froze for a second. Uh, he's put me to work. <laughs> Good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon. Good. Uh, you can uh, just state your name for the record and you can proceed with your testimony. I will. Thank you. So good afternoon, Council President Clark and members of City Council. My name is Shelley Cameron, and I am the Chief Executive Officer of the Division of Aviation, which is responsible for operating the Philadelphia International Airport and the Northeast Philadelphia Airport. Joining me today at this hearing are Tracy Borda, Chief Financial Officer, Delisha Wilds, Chief Administrative Officer, and a number of other members of our staff. I am here today to present testimony regarding the division's fiscal year 2023 operating budget. When I came before you last year, I noted that our passenger numbers in 2020 were the lowest we had seen since 1986, a decline in travel that resulted in approximately $500 million in combined lost revenue for PHL and PNE, all because of the pandemic. I am happy to say air service recovery is underway at PHL with passenger traffic sitting at approximately 75% of where it was in 2019. And that is up from the 50% level where we were at this time last year. We had good news this past year from Washington DC as well. The division was awarded approximately $115 million in relief funding to support operations. And in November, Congress passed a bipartisan infrastructure bill, which will inject approximately 150 million total into our airports over a five-year period to support projects like PHL's cargo expansion. Additionally, we have applied for discretionary grant funding under the bill and are fully committed to ensuring federal DBE goals are met as these funds are used. One important note, while we are extremely grateful for these resources, our airports still have a significant need for additional funding. This will be a priority my team will continue to advocate for in Harrisburg and Washington, D.C. The pandemic has taught us that we can't go back to business as usual. We had to tra make transformative changes to our operation to adapt to today's environment and succeed into the future. As you know, we are moving forward with structural changes to our public parking operation. I recognize that with these changes, there is also a human aspect. Please know, while I am not able to make decisions regarding the standing of non-city personnel, my team has received, received valuable input from this body and other stakeholders related to the contracted employees in our parking operation. At this point, here is what I know and what I can tell you. First, we have provided a bridge agreement with our current parking provider, the PPA, which stretches until the end of this calendar year to allow for a transition period. Second, we will be releasing an RFP over the summer, which will include diversity goals, something that our previous arrangement never had. Third, we anticipate the jobs within our parking operation will remain union jobs as most parking operators, including the incumbent, have collective bargaining agreements with various unions. Transitioning the structure of how parking services are provided to the public was an important decision for the city, one which will allow the airport to have a much more balanced relationship with our parking provider moving forward. My team also continues to emphasize the importance of creating pathways to employment and contracting opportunities at PHL for black and brown individuals. 
With me today is Jonathan Todd, our new Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Jonathan, along with the rest of our Racial Equity Advisory Council, is working on a long-term racial equity strategic plan that helps identify areas where we need to grow as an organization. Aviation has historically been a field dominated by white men, and our goal is to continue to break down barriers for minorities and women. Prior to my tenure as CEO, senior leadership at the airport was 86% white and 57% male. I'm proud to say today our leadership team is 62% women and nearly 40% people of color. We still have work to do, but I commit to this body to continue to make, to make progress towards a senior leadership team that better reflects our city's diversity. Finally, as we continue to recover, we need to bolster our workforce to support operations. Due to attrition and the success of our early retirement program, our workforce is down 25%, nearly 200 individuals. From fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 23, our budget will increase by approximately 36.6 million in part to support rehiring these folks and training. In closing, I wanna thank this body for the support that you've provided my team over the course of the last year. We've come a long way. Thank you for offering me time to speak and I'm happy to take any questions that you have at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, I have a few questions before I turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Councilman Jones, Majority Whip, uh, for standing in for us this morning. I um, understand they had a very good session. always appreciate a little break uh, from the humdrum of budget discussions. Uh, it's much appreciated. Uh, Ms. Cameron, I had a question to ask you about um, the new department, um, you know, we got this information from the mayor's office and had some conversations around, you know, what it's all about. And, you know, we are all about making change, but making change to benefit the citizens uh, primarily and then possibly the efficiency and the operation that ultimately we hope will um, improve and enhance uh, the, the citizens. Uh, for, participation and, and, and role uh, with the department or any particular department. Can you kind of walk me through uh, what is being proposed and understand it, the longstanding um, Commerce Department slash um, aviation uh, has been in place forever. That doesn't mean that it should stay in place forever. But just kind of tell me how will this improve uh, both the citizen experience and how will it actually possibly enhance the coffers of the airport and the operation of the airport? You can just kind of walk me through that, please. Absolutely, and thank you for the question, Council President. Um, so as you, as you stated, we've long time been a division of the Department of Commerce, and the city charter actually defines that that's the structure um, that, that was in place when, when the, the charter was, was put into place. And as we looked around um, at a lot of our peer airports, um, many of them, if not most of them, that are city owned and operated are um, direct reports to the mayor and individual operating departments. In Philadelphia in particular, what this will um, help us to do is by being an individual operating department is it'll provide a greater level of transparency and allow us to um, institutionalize some key processes and procedures. So under um, this administration, through a series of memorandums of understanding and, and other um, legal structures, we have been able to accept federal grants, as an example, um, to promulgate ru operating rules and regulations for the airport. Those kinds of things um, would be institutionalized with a charter change and would streamline um, doing everyday business for the airport. The second thing um, is that it would provide direct access to policymakers, which we think is important 
because when you look at the overall economic impact of the airport on the region, um, we felt that that a, a, a more direct access would allow us to advance um, things that are important to the airport as well as to the region and the city. And third, it allows for strategic based decisions for personnel. Um, it's more of a technicality, but because we're a division, we couldn't take certain actions when we were rolling out our early retirement program, as an example. And, and so, again, it would just really streamline a lot of the day-to-day -day things. Um, at the end of the day, if we can make decisions quicker, if we can execute documents um, quicker, if it, it, ultimately that's going to provide great benefit not just to the city um, in, in the form of not duplicating effort, but also to our passengers, many of whom are citizens of the city, um, because we'll be able to, to more quickly react to things that, that come down the pike. Um, at the end of the day, again, uh, we think that, that this is an important step for us to take um, to continue to amplify the economic benefit that we provide to the city and to the region. Okay, so you've referenced the fact that you have had these um, existing MOUs uh, with various departments. Are you suggesting that they have not worked? Uh, no, uh, to the contrary. I'm sorry. They, they've worked very well. Um, they've been MOUs that, again, allowed us to do things that normally would have had to have involved a two- or three-step process with the Commerce Department. So um, accepting grants from the FAA is an example. Um, you know, I, I can now accept grants on behalf of the city um, that are aviation related um, through this MOU. What the charter change would do and, and us becoming our own department is it would memorialize that moving forward so that the things that, that we've been able to do for the past six years that have been very beneficial would, would be um, put into place permanently. All right. So I just wanted to ask that question because, you know, you're currently functioning in a way that allows you to do what it is would be beneficial to the operation of the airport with the MOU agreements. Um, so this would not change that other than the simple designation of who you reported to directly. Am I correct? That's correct. That's absolutely okay. correct. And the other issue with respect to um, being able to report directly to policymakers, and, and I wasn't around when I'm assuming you weren't around when all of this was created. Um, but traditionally, uh, the Commerce Department, uh, which is a, a member of the mayor's cabinet, uh, this whole issue with respects to aviation uh, clearly was a driver of the economy, uh, both in moving people, moving cargo. So my assumption, and nobody told me this, but my assumption by being in the Commerce Department, you clearly were in the wheelhouse of policymakers, because you, I would suspect you would agree that the Commerce Department should be the primary policymaker as it relates to economic acti activity in the city of Philadelphia. Am I correct? Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, I, I found that very often, though, our, um, we were focusing on different initiatives. And, and the Commerce Department has, has a, a, a lot to do in the city. Um, and this would pull the aviation department out. And, you know, of course, we're always going to work with the Commerce Department, but it would um, allow us to, to really state the things that, that are airport um, designated. But yes, of course, we're always going to, to be a part, um, work in, in conjunction with the Commerce Department moving forward. But you, okay, um, I'm going to leave it alone. Okay, let me move on to a couple more because I know a number of members have questions. Um, not sure that you told me how it would change or enhance the operation of the airport, though, based on what you're proposing. I just don't get a sense of that, but you know. Okay, you, I'll, you've acknowledged I'll, that you're you'll be able to do certain things, and, and you now say you just continue to work with commerce. I'm just. You know, and I'm look. I've done a thousand charter changes, so I'm not adverse to doing charter changes personally. I've probably done way too many, according to some. But you know, that's that's not a, the issue. I just want to see how this improves the, you know, the ridership and the experience of the individuals. Um, we'll touch base with your office after the hearing and and try to do a better job of defining that. All right. Yeah. Well, I know we'll we'll be coming up with that soon. Um, let me ask you about. Um, Parking, it's 
in the news here of late, um, the economy a lot. And I know we had some conversations earlier about possibly closing down uh, some of the parking uh, to hopefully be in a position to create a much more um, productive use, i.e. Uh, cargo operations and other types of operations that would create significant number of, of not only family sustaining jobs, but possibly higher paying jobs. Um, I know you at some point were not at liberty to discuss the details of some of those proposals. Are you still not at liberty to discuss those proposals at any level of specificity? So I, I think, Council President, you're referring to um, the economy parking lot where we had talked about we had um, cargo development. One one of the um, business negotiations that we were having has concluded, and that's with a company called AFCO. Um, they will be developing um, swing space, if you will, for ground service handling companies um, that are currently located in cargo buildings. Um, we have a couple of cargo buildings, pretty old, but they have um, a, a distinct advantage um, of having a ramp in front of them. And when you think about how cargo works, it really has to work in conjunction the building and the ramp. So the plane pulls up on the ramp and then the building is used to, to process the goods. Um, we have things like bus maintenance and ground service equipment maintenance in that cargo building, which really doesn't allow things to work the way it was originally intended. And, and those things happen over time. But we do need a place to put all of these other aviation related um, activities. And the economy lot is, is was really a great place to do it. It has airfield access and um, at, you I think you've heard me say before, that's really beachfront property in the aviation world um, when you can get directly onto the airfield and these functions do need that access. And so AFCO um, has announced that they will be breaking ground within the coming months um, on that swing space um, building. It's a 70,000 square foot building. We think the construction of that building alone will be responsible for about 100 jobs. Um, and or is it, and I'm going to ask Jim to jump in and see if I'm missing anything, but that's really the first one. The other two are still bound by um, NDAs, but um, they're moving along pretty well. Jim? No, Shelley, I think you've uh, you've hit it. Um, part of the arrangement with AFCO is also to invest um, capital in refurbishing that cargo building that these tenants will be moved out of to enable it to better and more efficiently handle um, the processing of cargo directly from an aircraft. Okay, and those 100 jobs that would potentially be created are short term. What about the long term jobs? How many and what kind of uh, salaries will those people approximately? What are we looking at? Because I, you know, I was led to believe that we were looking at some significant levels of employment opportunity. And, and we are. This is really just real, the first phase. Um, overall, for all of the cargo development, we are anticipating about 22,000 jobs. Um, about 22,000 of those are construction jobs, and about 6,000 of them are permanent jobs. The significant part about the cargo um, permanent jobs is that they will fall into that $35,000 to $100,000 range, which is um, an, an area where Philadelphia falls short of. It's, it's those really you know, good family sustaining jobs um, that, that don't always necessarily require a, a, a college degree. And so um, we're, we're pretty excited about those long-term benefits. It's difficult to say how many permanent jobs will be added with this first phase. Um, it's, it's really dependent on the tenants that we bring in, but it'll, it'll number in probably a couple hundred um, jobs permanent. Okay. And the loss of parking, um, I, I think I saw a story where basically it was like a no vacancy sign put up on the airport in terms of parking and they're telling people to figure out another way how to get there. Is that going to be a, as we come out of COVID and hopefully we don't experience anything like we've done over the last two years, are we going to be in a position where we're going to, I hate to use the term inconvenience people by asking them to take some other type of remote travel uh, to get to the airport. But I, I got to believe that that could potentially, 
you know, create a, uh, a, an environment where people may not want to use the airport because they don't have access to parking. So it, that's, it's, a, it's a really great question. And um, as we went into COVID, we shut down the economy a lot because, quite frankly, it's very expensive to operate. Um, it requires a shuttle bus service um, to take passengers to and from the terminals and the lot. And that was something without any passengers, we, we could really not afford. Um, as we've moved forward um, and as, as our development plans have started to firm up, we made the decision a number of months ago that we could reopen 1,850 spots in the economy lot. Now, that that's really a fraction of what was there before, but um, we feel that that, that is um, something that is called for with current demand, and it's something that we can afford. Now, I'll, I'll put it out there that even with um, the 2,000 spaces and at a reduced busing level and everything, we still are concerned that we're really only going to break even or potentially lose money on that operation. But we feel that it's imp an important enough um, customer service initiative to put it out there. Re regarding messaging, um, you know, we, um, especially in regards to the, the most recent holiday weekend, we proactively um, went out there and are, have been talking about the fact that parking is limited. We've given um, our guests access to off airport parking operators where many of them can make arrangements, um, reservations. Um, and we really, really wanted to get that, that approximately 2,000 space lot open in time for the holiday weekend. Um, we just, with our current bus provider, we couldn't get the vehicles or the drivers ready to open it up in time for the, the holiday weekend. And so it'll open up this Thursday. But um, we are going to watch the performance of that lot over the, the spring and summer. Um, we do have some potential maybe for opening up some additional spaces. Um, and, you know, really, it might just be for the summer, but we're going to take a look at that as, as we go along. Um, we want to make sure that we leave room for that development because that's the long range plan for the airport. But again, in, in the short term, um, we're going to do what we can to serve the needs of our guests. OK, I'm just a uh, little concerned. You know, we had that conversation earlier about the elimination of the lots and, you know, Clearly, making a hundred thousand dollar job available to somebody is, you know, probably a little more significant to that individual that's fortunate enough to get that job versus a parking attendant. I uh, understand that, but the bottom line is, I don't want us to be in a position where we're eliminating potential users of the airport because that people know that there's not going to be anywhere to park, and people do have options. I mean, uh, may have to travel a little further, but you know, just some of the remote. Wait, give me you know, one last one. This question. I'm, I'm going to turn this over to my colleagues. I've used up way beyond my time. Uh, did, tell me what are the options uh, specifically? If I if there's full like it was this weekend, what do I do? I need to get to the airport. What are my options again? So there's garage parking that is available. Um, as of Thursday, there will be economy parking that is available, and there are a number when of you say, When you say garage parking, you're talking about in the airport garages? Airport garages, that's correct. Right. And, and I'm assuming that's much more expensive, right? It, it is, um, but we do have a, um, a reduced rate for folks who stay. Um, the, the rate as of Thursday will be folks who stay as of four or more days will get a reduced rate in the garages, and then it'll be even a step down cheaper um, for them to go to the economy parking lot. Okay. Um, that, that's all on airport, and then there are a number of off-airport parking providers um, who are also available, and we've provided links, directions, um, all of those sorts of things. The other thing that we've done is is a lot of um, messaging around, you know, if you live in the city and you can take Uber or Lyft, if you can take SEPTA, um, you know, if you can get dropped off and picked up, that that those are also options um, to make sure that you know that you can get to the airport on time. Okay. All right. Um uh, I'm not going to ask you any more questions on this one at this time, but I'm just I'm just still 
I'm still up in the air on, you know, the benefits associated with uh, what we're talking about. Maybe when I see what the new jobs will be that will be coming online, it might shift my focus. I, I, I think so. And, and one other thing I would add in, and that's that the nature of our business is changing significantly. Yeah. Um, we used to have a lot of business travel, um, about 45% at balanced with leisure travel. And it's, it's really changed, which makes predicting how many parking spaces we need very, very difficult. And yeah. we're not the only ones. Um, there are parking problems up and down the East Coast and across the country right now. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And I apologize to my colleagues for the lengthy questions, but I probably won't jump back in. So I wanted to get them in early on. Uh, chair recognizes Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Council President, and thank you for the questions that you have already offered, some of which um, I have discussed uh, with the team uh, down at the airport relative to parking and reaching out about the concerns that we've heard uh, around the short-term parking. But I just had a few questions because I know um, that uh, we were in a previous hearing a little while ago, and I wanted to just get this on the record relative to uh, what are some of the, the new policies and programs um, that you all have developed down at the airport to increase uh, diverse business participation um, on contracts and, you know, at the concessions? And I know we've talked about this. I mentioned a couple of uh, potential even restaurateurs, you know, who could be uh, down at the airport who are local here to Philadelphia, but also speaks to more of the Philadelphia culture um, that folks will experience uh, when they come to Philadelphia. So can you talk about how you all are working to increase uh, business participation on contracts and concessions uh, down at the airport? Absolutely. Um, and, and before I turn it over to Kathy Padilla, I just want to say that um, I'm really kind of sad because this is Kathy's last hearing. Um, Kathy will be retiring after um, quite frankly, a fearless and, and remarkable career in advancing these, um, the, the interests of, of businesses that are owned by minorities and women. Um, so Kathy, you know, thank you for everything that you've done. I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, hopefully not one last time today, but, but during your final hearing. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, my name is Kathy Padilla and I'm the deputy director of aviation for the office of business diversity. And thank you for your question, council member. Uh, one of the things that we're most excited about is our pending waiver application with the FAA, which would allow us to have separate Black and Hispanic-owned sub-goals on our concessions. Uh, this would be a first in the nation if we get it approved. Some of the other things we've done, and thank you for making the connection with the Black Business Coalition for us, is that we've developed a new micro-business program that's going to allow our very smallest operators to have locations at the airport and provide some shelf space for ones who aren't quite ready to have smaller locations. That has uh, been a very fruitful partnership, and we're really looking forward to developing more of that. Um, some of the other things we're very happy to look forward to in the coming year is we're going to be having eight new Black-owned concessionaires opening this year. Uh, four of those will be owned by a Black woman. And we've continued to work on our efforts to right-size contracts in the contracting sphere. Uh, this last year, we had 29 MWBE primes, and 15 of those were minority-owned businesses. So we think we're, we're moving that along some well. And, you know, developing those primes really helps us develop all of the sub-consultants under them as well. Um, one of the things that we're also excited about is the infrastructure projects that are coming to the region. And we're part of the committee that the city has uh, put together to try and develop an approach to ensuring diverse business participation on these projects. One of the things that's really important to uh, recognize is that our analysis of the statewide uh, money that's coming down for these projects is that 80% of that are going to be under the USDOT business programs, not under the local OEO program. So those goals and those procedures will apply. And to help prepare the city for that, uh, last week, I drafted a uh, guidebook for city agencies on how to try and work with these programs and raise their goals on our on our uh, projects here by having because the goals of say PennDOT, if it's FHWA funds, are going to apply to the city projects and all of those requirements. So we have to look, look towards 
working better with PennDOT and its methodology to raise those goals. Some of the other things we've been looking at for that is um, to try and identify barriers for the city and to do more capacity building. It's important to take a look at not just broad stroke business development in the region, but we have to look at the areas where these biz where these opportunities will be, what we call the NACE codes in the industry. So we did an analysis of uh, our three-year uh, three year goal setting under the FAA, of SEPTA's three-year goal setting, and of PennDOT's three-year goal setting to get a subset of these NACE codes that are going to be most used on infrastructure projects. And okay. this will provide... No, go ahead, Kathy. I'm sorry. And this will provide an opportunity for commerce and other agencies, eh? to outreach to find those businesses specifically that are going to be working on these projects, not just a shotgun approach to business development, but also to provide commerce to partner with some of the other business development agencies to target specifically the types of businesses we need for these projects. So uh, we're hopeful that some of these approaches will, will really increase what we're able to achieve under the infrastructure projects. Okay, that'll um, be great. I, I know the bell is going to ring soon, and I'll probably have to come back on the second round. But I wanted to say specifically around the infrastructure project, and I know there's this big 30, 40 person uh, roundtable um, that the administration has put together, but I do think it's important that you all uh, sort of work um, with um, our federal partners directly on any potential opportunities around aviation. Um, because while we know that some of these dollars will be formula based, uh, a large number of these projects will be competitive and we'll need to have the opportunity to prepare uh, to put those applications together to see how um, it makes sense based on our current framework here in Philadelphia and what the department is seeking to accomplish. So I just wanted to put that out there and thank you for that response, Kathy. But additionally, uh, Shelly, I wanted to, to circle back to you because that's a lot of institutional knowledge to lose. Um, and, and Kathy, and, and just talk about sort of the secession planning for the airport and for aviation around ensuring that um, minority participation continues to be one of the number one goals um, for uh, your department, uh, particularly because we know that a lot of the contracts you all uh, may or may not do at different times are very specialized, right? And so, you know, the pool of applicants we're always told is, is already on the smaller side. And we want to make sure that our local Philadelphia a minority and women-owned businesses have an opportunity to buy not only for a, a large number of the concession opportunities, but for some of the other more specialized projects on the professional services side, knowing that we have qualified uh, individuals here um, and companies here that can buy for those opportunities. And so I just wanted to to put that on the record as well. And, and as you stated, um, Kathy, you had mentioned briefly around the connection with PennDOT, and we recognize the importance of transportation um, for our region, but I wanted to talk about and, and mix that in quickly with sustainability and how you all are sort of looking at and planning um, and incorporating sustainability in all of the work that will be happening at the airport, knowing um, what that area was uh, previously. And I'll be more than happy to come back on the second round, but that's the question. How are you incorporating sustainability in all the projects you all are currently working on? Okay, great. Thanks. Th thanks for those questions. And so I'll just very quickly address um, Kathy's department. Her, she has depth in her department and folks who are uh, well trained and have years of experience in the federal programs. And so um, we feel confident that um, either through with one of them or um, through a, a field process that we've already started for Kathy's job that we'll be able to carry on um, the, the amazing work. Um, second thing I wanted to mention is that our discretionary grant process has already started and we've already put in an application for an aviation project. Um, so th those were due a number of weeks ago and we put in for grant money to help fund our restroom project. And uh, we could talk more about that one later if you'd like, but I'm going to turn it to Oppie for just a, a brief um synopsis of what we're doing to incorporate sustainability into our projects as well. Api? Thank you, Shelley. Good afternoon, Council Member. Uh, my name is Api Uppalingham. I'm the Deputy Director of the Capital Development Program. Uh, first, I want to say Happy Earth Week. 
Uh, it's one of my first, uh, one of my favorite weeks. So in terms of sustainability, a really good week to recognize what we can do to contribute to our planet and our communities. Um, some of the highlights for us in terms of sustainability and in how we're embedding that into our capital projects is last year, we mentioned that we were entering the airport carbon accreditation program. It's the, the global recognition program that says airports are prioritizing their carbon footprint. And I'm happy to say we're the first airport in Pennsylvania to achieve level one uh, accreditation. And there are only 23 airports in this country that have achieved that level. So we're gonna build upon that first level uh, with our projects and keep rising in those levels with our commitment to carbon neutrality. Um, one of the other initiatives that we uh, rolled out last year is we upgraded our design standards. I know that's something that's very important to you. So we actually have now uh, gold, lead gold as our target for construction projects and we've removed even the 10,000 square foot cap. Um, so any projects that include uh, construction of buildings, um, no matter what size they are, we're going to be achieving lead um, in, in those projects. And at p and &E, we're uh, moving forward with an administration building and that will be one of the first ones that falls under our new design standard. So uh, looking forward to achieving uh, more projects that are lead gold accredited at PHL. Um, Okay, yeah, and Poppy, yep. <clears throat> I thank you for that response and apologies for cutting you off, but I did hear the bell and I do want to honor the clock uh, as stipulated uh, by the rules of this session. So I will certainly come back on the second round so that we can continue that part of the conversation around sustainability. But I thank you for recognizing the importance of this week um, in the work that we are continuing to do. And I'll finish on the, the second round uh, with the balance of my questions. But thank you very, very much. And thank you, Council President, for the latitude. Absolutely. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, Chair recognizes Councilman Dunn. Thank you, uh, Council President, and uh, good afternoon, Shelley. I have a few questions I just wanted to ask you and your team, and I want to also thank you for all the work you've done, especially getting through COVID. You had to have one of the most difficult jobs uh, during COVID because hospitality was crushed across the board, and so were airlines, hotels, everything, restaurants. So I'd like to understand, compared to 2019, the tourism travel at the airport compared to 2019, are we at similar levels today, or are we still behind 2019 for the tourism and also business travel? Um, so let me take business travel first. We have been doing um, Wi-Fi intercept surveys of our guests throughout COVID, and we've been watching the percent of business travelers rise um, over the past number of months. And um, we we were at about, we were at 45% pre-COVID um, during 2020 and a lot of 20. 21, we were at near zero business travel. Um, and at the, at, I'd say the last six months of, of 2021, um, we started to get up into the 30% range and we're now currently exceeding 30% on a, on a regular basis. We've even had a couple of days where it was 40%. So that's, that's really great news. We also heard from American Airlines, our hub carrier, that um, a number of their corporate clients have started booking um, business travel again, and that's really good news for us. Re regarding visitation to the city, um, it is still down. Um, leisure travel is up, but um, not as much to urban centers as it is to places, um, beaches and mountains was, was what we always talked about during COVID. And um, we haven't had quite the, the visitation that we have before. It's also been dampened by um, us not having as many um, conventions scheduled in Philadelphia. Now that's business of course, but it also drives a lot of leisure travel as well. And so we've suffered in, in that regard. Um, where I think we've suffered the most though is in international travel and those numbers are down significantly. We're hopeful that with the resumption of transatlantic service, that those numbers will start to creep back up, but um, it's it's still a bit of a challenge. Uh, in general then, from 2019 to let's say 2021, how much, what percentage were we down in total travel? Um, 2021, um, we were still down by 40%. That doesn't tell the whole story, though, because about the last six months of 2021, we were only down 30%. So it's get it's continuously getting better. And as we look ahead to the summer, 
um, we're looking to only be down somewhere in the 15 to 20 percent range um, in terms of scheduled seats. We hope that that translates into passengers in seats, but um, as of right now, that's that's really what we're looking at to try and um, determine what the rest of the year will look like. Okay, I, I want to bring that up because I think the airport is such an important part of our economy, and we need to get you back up to those levels of 2019 or higher any way we can. So in, in the area, I know the council president was talking about the cargo. What can council do to support you in this effort? Because cargo is the future. It's a big deal, and we it's big for our economy. What can we do as council to help support you? Um, I'm going to turn that over to Jim Tyrell to, to talk more about the cargo program, but I think there are a number of things um, that you can do to support us, um, including um, joining in our ask for additional federal infrastructure money for the cargo program to move forward those enabling projects. So, Jim? Good afternoon, Council Member. I'm Jim Tyrell. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at Southern International. And, uh, Thank you for, for asking what you can do to help because we are working on a number of enabling projects right now. One is the relocation of a roadway, and the other is the completion of our wetlands mitigation program, which is going really well, by the way. And uh, it's a partnership with the city of Philadelphia down at, um, down at the, the Franklin um, Park. Um, but the other thing we're working on, quite frankly, is a number of initiatives that will help improve the cargo program that we are um, actively working on right now. We've talked to PennDOT about the improved access to and from the airport. We're talking to a number of the elected officials um, to, again, um, provide support for the initiatives that the airport's putting forth, uh -huh. uh, not only with the planners, but also at the state and federal levels as well. Uh, let me ask you a question, Jim. If I worked at the airport, what is the best way of mass transit for me to get there? Is it the train? Is that the only option? So we have a number of, of ways to get here, train and bus, but the train is absolutely um, a, a phenomenal way to get to and from the airport if you were, if you live in the city. Um, SEPT is a great partner. It actually drops you off right in front of the terminal complex and um, they actually work really well with, uh, with the airport. And so uh, on a federal request, if you can get to our office and I'll try to get all my colleagues on board. Whatever we can do to get federal money, we're 100% there. <laughs> That's an easy one. That's an easy ask. So whatever we can do, please let us know. We want to help you get that money. Uh, I have another question I just wanted to ask because I'm trying to understand what's going on with the masking. I, I saw some court case in Florida there where they're saying that masks are not required on airplanes, but I do think the CDC is still recommending masking on planes. Is, is that correct? That's a really good question and something that hit really <laughs> late yesterday. So um, something we've been when dealing with all morning. Um, so the the federal case that came out of the, the Florida court um, basically um, did away with the federal mask mandate. So the CDC rule that underlied the um, was underlying the TSA federal security directive. So um, TSA came out with a statement this morning that said that they will no longer be enforcing, providing any kind of enforcement activity or civil penalties for folks who are not wearing masks. Um, they as federal employees are still required to wear masks, but they will not be enforcing anything. Um, there were a number of security directives that one applied to airports, one applied to air carriers, one applied to international carriers. Um, all of them were done away with. Um, and the air carriers, the four largest, so um, American, United, Delta, and Frontier, have all said that they will no longer be enforcing mask requirements on board aircraft now. So um, as a city building um, and a city owned and operated airport, we have an emergency regulation in place that, that went um, to effect in May of 2020. And it is still in effect. So we are still asking people to wear masks within the um, facility. Um, so it's a requirement in the facility, but it's it's confusing. And and the the passengers, um, you know, are, are are saying things like, "Well, I've okay, I have to wear a mask in the in the terminal, but then I take it off when I get on the aircraft." And it's so it, it, it caught a lot of us um, by surprise. But, you know, look, in accordance with where the health department thinks things are, um, we are continuing with our mass mandate until we hear otherwise from them. So just from a, 
on my last this comment. If I'm taking a plane tomorrow, when I get to the airport, I put a mask on inside the terminal. But when I get on the plane, I'm allowed if I decide to take off the mask. It's okay, or I can keep it on. That is correct. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council President. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Sounds kind of goofy to me, but you know, we're we're local, so we have no jurisdiction. Uh. Chair recognizes Councilman Thomas. Thank you, Council President. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I um, want to uh, first echo the sentiments of my colleagues as it relates to some of the concerns that's already communicated around um, parking. Um, I think that that is a significant concern. I'm curious to see um, how that is going to play itself out. I don't think it's a good idea just to tell people to catch the bus or get dropped off. Um, but we, you know, I, I don't want to. Uh, do a deep dive there. Let me let me let me ask a couple questions um, related to some concerns that I have around uh, quality of customer experience. Right. So um, for us uh, on the side that we sit in, we think often about the constituents and um, different issues that people have within the airport. I heard Council Member Dom's line of questioning that talked about um, how much uh, business uh, traveling we see. But I'll start with tourists traveling. Um, I didn't hear where we are with tourist traveling. So can you give me uh, the numbers as it relates to um, tourist traveling and um, what type of, of uptake we, we are seeing so far and where do we need to be to get back to pre-COVID um, traveling conditions? Um, I don't have those numbers at my fingertips. Um, I'm going to see if Kate does of our team. And if she doesn't, we're going to have to get those specific numbers back to you. Uh, Shelly, I do not. We will have, we, we can get back with those numbers though. Okay. I apologize. Okay. I, I don't have those numbers with me. Yeah, that, that's going to be really important for us. And then thinking about, you know, how we travel, it sounds simple, but just, you know, quality of life issues. I, I, I had somebody tell me a story that uh, talked about um, the, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm clearly I'm a Philadelphia resident my entire life. So I've used Philadelphia International Airport as well. And I think um, there are some things that we can do to be a little better for the constituents. Um, the parking thing, again, just want to emphasize that. But then also, um, when someone lands late at night, like after 9 p.m., uh, how can we guarantee that whatever gate that they land at, that there is an option for them to be able to exit from that gate and they not have to walk to another gate when they exit, especially late at night? Can, can there be a guarantee that we can assure that people um, have um, the easiest means of traveling once they land in Philadelphia? Because that's a concern that's been communicated to me multiple times. Um, it's a concern that we hear often as well. And um, unfortunately, the TSA um, controls when the, the checkpoints open and close and they don't have the manpower to monitor the checkpoints, all of the checkpoints after certain hours. Um, in terminals D and E, as you may know, if you've flown on Spirit or Frontier or United well, or I'm, Delta. I'm sorry to cut you off, and I promise the only reason I'm doing it is because I'm limited on time. So I'm wondering if TSA, right, TSA is federal, national, right? So, you know, New York has TSA, New Jersey has TSA. Shoot, uh, uh, um, um, right across the bridge over there, uh, they have TSA. So I'm wondering why why is that a Philadelphia based problem? Like right, like why don't people in other big cities like Pittsburgh and other places like that have that type of issue with their TSA, but we have that issue here with our TSA? Well, it, it also depends on the layout of the airport. We have a number of entrances and exits. Um, and some of the airports that you just cited have fewer exits, so it's less manpower required to keep them open for more hours. We have so many um, terminals that all have individual screening and, and exit points that um, it's it's difficult for TSA so, to provide those levels. Um, in D&E, so, so places, that have, so places that have airports than us, so I think about maybe like Atlanta or Chicago, I would, if I reach out to some of my council colleagues in those places, they'll tell me that they have the similar problem that we have because they have large airports as well too. Um, well, Atlanta has limited number of exits, um, but they, they, like us, have issues with TSA staffing levels, um, whether it's screening to go into the airport or monitoring exits to come out. 
um, they uh, all airports across the country um, are are struggling with TSA staffing levels. And TSA has warned us this summer that they are going to be particularly challenged. Um, they are struggling to hire enough people to to do the work that they have in front of them. I'm just going to respectfully say that I'm struggling with that response because I've I, I know for a fact that this was an issue pre COVID. Um, I'm going to reach out to other big cities um, across the country because, you know, that's nothing for, but a text for me to ask some of my colleagues in um, Atlanta and Chicago and New York to see if they have similar issues with their TSA and to see if their TSA puts them in a position where it impacts when someone lands in their city, um, them not being able to exit from the gate that they land in. I, I would also push to say that if we know we have TSA issues as far as staff, then why would we land an airplane in a gate that we know is closed. I'm not going to necessarily ask for that nuanced response right now, but this is some of the quality of life stuff that lands on our desks as elected officials that puts us between a rock and a hard place because at the end of the day, now I'm supposed to go back to constituents and essentially communicate to them that it's a TSA issue, and they're going to look at me like I'm crazy because they understand that TSA is something that is in existence all across the country, and if I am traveling all across the country and I go to other major cities, but I only have this issue when I land in Philadelphia. It makes people not want to fly into Philadelphia. Right. Like these are the quality of life things that I think that we can actually do something about that will help generate um, more business as it relates to people not just coming to the city, but flying into Philly. Far too often people fly into another airport and then drive into Philadelphia because they don't want to deal with the nuanced problems of the Philadelphia International Airport. So I just wanted to put that out there. You do have my support. I hope you don't take this as a bashing session. I think I could list a lot of other things that, um, you know, we have issues with as a municipality that I can complain about. Uh, but I do think that this is one of those things that's more important than what we talk about. And when the average everyday person is making their of flight arrangements and their flight plans. They think about these things. They think about the fact I don't want to land in Philly after 10 o'clock because I can land anywhere and end up walking for, for a significant amount of time. So please consider uh, some of the recommendations I, I am making right now as it relates to gates and where people land. I'll also reach out to my colleagues across the country who have bigger, uh, who, who represent big cities to see what some of the best practices that as it relates to this issue. Um, thank you to the entire aviation team for all you're doing, and thank you, Council President, for allowing me to ask my line of questioning. Absolutely. Thank you, Councilman. I had to do a lot of walking in my, my travels over the years, uh, particularly late at night, as you referenced. Um, she recognizes Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson for a second round of questioning. Mr. President, how are you, sir? Oh, Councilwoman Parker? Yes, Mr. President. Thank you so very much. Oh, sorry. Um, they didn't, uh, somebody was, somebody was, slacking. They didn't uh, put your name no, up. No, I was connected, uh, Mr. President, and then got disconnected and had oh. to come back on. So this is not on the staff. Right. <laughs> she recognizes Councilwoman Parker. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, let me start by saying when I did, uh, I got on early, I heard uh, Council President Clark addressing um, the charter change question along with uh, parking um, in the economy uh, a lot. So, Council President, uh, thank you. So, And I'm looking forward um, to those uh, responses during the hearing uh, about that information that uh, you said you will follow up uh, with his office. So thank you. Um, I want to go back to uh, Council Member Gilmore Richardson's line of questioning um, regarding diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion. We uh, had uh, procurement um, in front of us today, and um, they gave us um, their uh, transparency and a business report uh, for the city of Philadelphia. And you all may be familiar with this. Uh, this council uh, passed legislation to establish a process uh, whereby those firms that were benefiting from doing business with the city of Philadelphia, that that information um, be publicly filed and available uh, f f you know, 
as it relates to the city on its website. Um, so not just the firms themselves, but their demographic makeup, um, how, how much in terms of value were the contracts um, they were getting. Let me let me ask you, uh, Shelly, does does the airport have anything similar where um, because I, I heard you in the exchange with Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson talk about um, or she mentioned the very sort of skilled and, and specialized supports that many of your uh, contractors provide. Uh, is there any kind of process that's publicly available where we can uh, see who those firms are who are benefiting from doing business with the city, particularly those who have had long term annual contracts renewed on an annual basis just because of their specialized uh, service? Um, yeah, yes, the answer is yes. And um, I'm going to ask uh, Deatrice Isaac um, to, to talk about what information is available for our contracts um, and or Tracy Board, our CFO. Good afternoon. My name is Deatrice Isaac and I am the Deputy of Airport Procurement. Um, contracting information is made public after the award. So if there's information that you're looking for regarding um, how much the contracts are, are um, that, that spend for a total contract or things like that, that information is uh, available and we can certainly provide it if it's some a specific vendor you're interested in finding out about. So I, I want to just uh, very humbly ask, um, specifically while we're um, sort of uh, considering and working through the charter uh, change legislation, um, that if the airport um, would find a way to sort of annually document, I mean, Shelly, tell me overall, we got a number today um, regarding services, um, regarding professional services, supplies, like all of the different buckets, right? In, in, in contracts that are issued on an annual uh, a basis with the airport, what what value would you place? What dollar amount would you say uh, in terms of contracts overall with all of your buckets in terms of the business being done at the airport? What dollar amount value would you give to it? Um, I don't have a specific number right now. Tracy, do you have a guesstimate? Hi, hi. This is Tracy Borda, Chief Financial Officer at the airport. Our, our contractual services a budget um, is usually somewhere around. I mean, through COVID, it was lowered quite a bit, but I would say about 90 million overall, and that's in. Uh, so that's class 200, and that would include things that are like uh, that are in professional services, services, supplies, and equipment. Um, and uh, and to and to some extent, it would also include construction, depending on whether or not we're using capital dollars or operating dollars. But that also includes capital dollars. Thank, um, thank, so bit, thank you ahead. so much for that response, Tracy. So the buckets we had were construction, supply services, and equipment, and then professional services. Um, and overall, for us as a city, it was about three hundred million, right? But the idea of uh, that we would um, get an opportunity to, again, on an annual basis, see who the firms were, not that we had to look up any special firm, but in one document, housed in a public place, empowering the tool of transparency, similar to what we did with um, the Walter P. Lomax TIBA, it would really help Philadelphia-based and minority businesses overcome a hurdle that I didn't think about until I heard our procurement commissioner say it today. And she talked about one of the barriers was forecasting forecasting what contracts would be av uh, available and that if minority firms had access to um, what was potentially coming down the line, that would give them the opportunity uh, to prepare. And so I just want to um, ask that you all take that uh, into uh, consideration. Um, considering uh, I've been very pleased uh, while listening, um, particularly to uh, Kathy's response to Council uh, Member Gilmore about the, um, the FAA and, and you're waiting for uh, the, the the waiver. So I was really happy um, uh, to hear that. Want to go back to that and ask you, how long do we have to wait? When will we know what what's happening? What's the timeline like there? If you could, and if you could give me a short one for that, uh, how long is it going to take before they give us the okay? Well, uh, Kathy Padilla, uh, Deputy Director for Diversity uh, for for the Business Diversity. Our last communications with the FAA. 
were that they were expecting to make a decision at the end of April, beginning of May, but they have no uh, regulatory requirement to meet a timeline on this. Okay. Well, you should, I hope you all shout it from the rooftop if it's in the um, uh, affirmative. Um, and uh, I was also pleased to hear you note the um, the eight Black-owned concessions that you were adding, um, right? And uh, Kathy, you said 29, and I didn't get, you said 29 additional, and I wasn't sure what you said after that. When uh, you those, were speaking. Were, those were firms that were acting as prime contractors. Those were M and WBE firms. And um, I have a further breakdown of that. 15 of those minority firms, 14 were women-owned firms. Of the minority firms, uh, 13 were black-owned, one was Hispanic-owned, and one was subcontinent Asian-owned. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, uh, again, even with that information, when you mentioned uh, the 29 um, uh, primes, finding out who they are, right, becomes uh, extremely uh, important uh, to us so that we can not uh, just get the information of your forecasting uh, to share, but we will know who is actually benefiting from doing business um, with our uh, airport. Uh, finally, I want to uh, ask you um, this, when you think about how much money you budget for initiatives and um, sort of just letting the MBE, WBE world know that business is available. Do you have a dollar amount that you budget like for marketing? Um, I'll give you a little bit of frustration. We were talking about a challenge with recruitment um, in the city of Philadelphia with our police department. And then we look at a budget and see that only $10,700 was spent on marketing. And I can usually tell what's important to any of you who are here today by looking at and how you spend your money in your checking account. So, so tell me, what does your marketing budget look like, or how do you uh, interact um, with uh, particularly local firms and MBE, WBEs? What's your process? Um, looking at the amount first, it's hard to say because uh, different departments within the airport do a piece of our diversity work. Capital Development Group helps with that. Procurement helps with that. My office helps with that. My guesstimate is for all of our diversity services, and it's really an approximation, about $2.2 million. And hi, this is Tracy Borda again. I would say, Kathy, you are definitely in the ballpark. When we look at um, uh, specific staff titles and what they do, as well as the um, uh, tremendous amount of outreach that we do, we do different sessions, we do a business opportunity forum, we post all of our upcoming opportunities, all of that, uh, the, the costs involved in setting up all those sessions um, for outreach, it's probably, yeah, it's definitely over $2 million. Okay. Well, thank you for having a, a, a dollar amount to, to show. I'm uh, going to be looking forward to getting the information uh, regarding um, the charter uh, change, um, its impact, and sort of the benefit to the city of Philadelphia when you forward that information uh, to Council President Clark. And I want to have further conversations uh, with you, Shelley, um, and, and members of your team about how we empower the tool of transparency and make that information public about who the firms are doing business uh, with the airport. Thank you all so very much and got to give a shout out to Shane uh, Dow for all of the uh, the great work and Kathy um, thank you for all of your contributions over the years. Thank you Mr. President. Thank you Councilwoman. She recognizes Councilman Green and Councilwoman the oversight uh, on your name was mine uh, so just want to make sure the staff are did not get the brunt of concern raised by anybody. It was all on me. Chair recognizes Councilman Green. Thank you, Council President. That is the mark of a good employer. Absolutely. <laughs> um, very briefly, wanted to touch base um, with Shelley and all your uh, staff at the airport, uh, especially as it pertains to uh, the Investment Infrastructure Jobs Act. Um, what opportunities do you see that the airport will be able to take advantage with that funding um, going forward um, to address some of the capital needs for the airport? Thank you for that question. Um, we, we are so excited about the infrastructure funding. Um, there are two parts to the aviation portion of the bill. 
The first is an entitlement portion that's based on number of passengers. And our share of that will be about 150 million over five years. So approximately $30 million a year. Our current plan is to spend that on cargo development so that we can advance some of the um, enabling projects for, for that program. The second piece, um, the discretionary piece of the bill, uh, we have to apply for. Um, and there are a series of criteria that the government um, will be assessing um, for the projects that we put in for funding for. And I'm going to ask Oppie, um, we've put in an application for our restroom program, and I'm going to ask Oppie to address that application. Thank you, Shelley, and good afternoon, Council Member. Um, as Shelley said, so the FAA has two parts of funding and the specific competitive part of funding, the notice of opportunity for that was released earlier uh, this year. And for that uh, part of funding, what the FAA wants to look at is projects that increase capacity and passenger access, projects that replace aging infrastructure, projects that achieve a compliance with ADA and expand accessibility for persons with disabilities, uh, projects that improve access for historically disadvantaged populations and projects that improve energy efficiency. So as Shelley said, uh, we have submitted a project that we feel competes really well uh, across airports uh, in this country, and that's our restroom renovation program or the next phase of our restroom renovation program, where we're going to be reconstructing 30 restrooms building two new restrooms, and then also building nursing mother's rooms, service animal relief areas, gender neutral restrooms, and adult uh, changing uh, rooms. So we know that these are all important amenities for our guests. And uh, in addition to that, we're also installing energy efficiency uh, measures in our infrastructure program, like uh, LED lighting um, and HVAC and plumbing. And so we know that all of these elements uh, check the box with the FAA in what they're looking for with this grant. And uh, we, we strongly feel it will be a, a great project um, for us and also compete well. well thank you for um, those responses, uh, especially considering the work that the city has been doing regarding uh, the American Disability Act, um, the investments we're making here in the city, in particular City Hall, but those investments um, and those opportunities for projects under the Investment Infrastructure and Job Act um, definitely seem aligned with some of the things that we're trying to do to make the city uh, much more, um, I'll just say, less ableist um, and open for people of all backgrounds and perspectives, regardless if they have physical learning differences. And I think it will help provide and continue the work that the airport has done going back to when they started the Autism and Air program many years ago with Delta um, to what I think will happen through the ADA accommodations that are being made, plus um, this new opportunity through the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. Uh, so thank you for that information. Thank you, Council President. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as we relax uh, protocols due to um, mass mandates and as we move a little closer to the edge when it comes to that, I, I can't help but think about the brave men and women that work for you that um, had to experience during the height of that pandemic um, total occupation for, you know, people that weren't looking for planes, but were looking for shelter. Uh, and can you help us to understand how you guys made it through that? I heard some, um, some stories, but I'd rather hear it from you guys, how you were able to manage through that rough time. So you're talking about the unsheltered population that, that really took up residence in 2020. Um, yeah, that was, that was rough. Um, it, we found ourselves, um, like many other airports in the country, to be truthful, um, where a number of unsheltered folks um, came to the airport to, to try to 
to be safe. And um, what we did during that time, we we had um, well over a hundred um, who were here for an extended period of time in uh, baggage claim A East. Um, we provided as many services as we could. Um, and then we ultimately put into place an emergency regulation that said that um, because of the pandemic and the dangers that it posed to our employees to have to clean and, and take care of the facility, we, we were equipped to run an airport. We were not equipped to run a shelter. Um, we worked very closely with um, the Office of, of, of Homeless Services, um, MHP, um, and, and a number of others, including Delaware County, because Council Member Jones, a lot of those folks who came to the airport were not just Philadelphia residents. They were from all over the region and quite honestly, all over the country. And, and we worked with Delco and a number of other providers to, to ultimately um, try to place as many as possible um, at, at one point in May of 2020. Since then, um, our, our unsheltered numbers look to be around 20-ish a, a, a day. Um, but we have some successes that I'd like to point out. And, and we've continued those partnerships. Um, and we also have some security guards who are here roaming to make sure our passengers feel safe. And, and our Philadelphia police um, officers are, are helping as well. But the successes I'm speaking to, we have managed to place, and, and by the way, I have one operations officer who pretty much spends his time interacting with the population to make sure that they have access to services that they need. And we've been able to place into services 80 people. Some of them have come back, um, but many of them have stayed. And a number of, of the folks that we have just really need help. Um, some of the folks are have have issues and 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 are really um, disruptive to our operations. And we've um, worked to to three o two um a number of those folks as well. So you know it's 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 really taken the entire village of the city and the surrounding counties and the dedication of my employees, the custodial staff that cleans. The, the police officers who um, try to help as as well as our operations officers to to ultimately turn something that's a pretty pretty bad story um, in, into something that hopefully is getting people services that they need. Uh, I, and I appreciate that at the height of the pandemic, we went through that type of trauma, uh, not only in the airport, but down at 69th Street Terminal and other places. And, we had to we had to be sensitive to the human aspect of of this, and uh, I'm speaking to your employees. How have we done uh, holding the the uh, labor standards to your subcontractors by way of uh, wages? Have we? I remember when we many of us who are on this call were out at the airport at five in the morning at a shift change, fighting for those wage increases, the question was whether or not the subcontractors out there would follow uh, the city's lead. And can you give us a report on how that went? So there's the prevailing wage ordinance that was um, enacted a number of years ago. And all but I think just a handful of, of our concession employees are are being paid the prevailing wage. Um, I. I know it's just a handful, it's just a few. Um, and I, uh, the airline subcontract employees are all um, under the, the prevailing wage, are compliant with the prevailing wage act. Uh, I'm sorry, the, um, the living wage act. The prevailing wage act um, was uh, passed last year um, and that holds subcontracted employees to the prevailing wage for security guard and um, some of our concessions are already compliant. We have a plan to bring the rest of the, the concession operators into compliance and the airlines um, would become, would need to be compliant with the execution of a new um, use and lease agreement 
our our can, current agreement expires on June thirtieth. Can you send that list of uh, those uh, subcontractors to the president's office, as well as the chair of commerce uh, and economic development committee for city council, so that we can keep track of of that. Um, you know, I, I, I know that a lot of those um, employees that you have there live in our districts or are trying to afford to live in our districts. And that's an important component of it. When I found out what is the annual, what is the rate, hourly rate of baggage handlers at the airport? Um, right now, they're subject to the living wage, and I just want to make it clear, it was a living wage that, that most are compliant with, the prevailing wage is in the process of being implemented. Um, and I think the, the living wage right now is 14 something an hour. Um, it's whatever is called for in the ordinance. Um, it ultimately steps up to $15 an hour. At one point before that, I think they were being paid 3 $4 an hour? and they survived off of tips. So I'm glad and proud to hear that. And I wanna thank all our members here and um, member Johnson in particular, who is not here at the moment, but all of us had to go through that. Maria um, Sanchez was out there at five in the morning on those shift changes fighting for those, those wages. And um, Wilson Good Jr., who is no longer council member for that and I just retrospectively want to kind of remember those those improvements that we gave thousands of families thousands of families. so um, thank you mr. president thank you councilman thank you for your questions chair recognizes is councilman Squilla Councilman Squilla, you with us? Okay, maybe dropped off. Uh, Councilwoman Quinona Sanchez, do you want? Thank you, Council. Yes, thank you, yeah. Council President. I'll take his turn. You know, we're always uh, tag teaming. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Shelly, and to the entire team. Um, thank you, Kathy, for your service so much. We are incredibly grateful for all the work that you you have done over the years so i hope you have a lot of places to visit as part of your bu bucket list <laughs> retirement um a real quick question you know this airport industry you know like 9 11 you know bless your hearts for surviving this whole COVID challenge um recently we started seeing some of the regional airports starting to offer transportation for people to go to them instead of coming to Philadelphia. Can you speak to me a little bit about that and how that helps or hurt, hurts us? Atlantic City, we're talking about Bethlehem, Allentown. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Um, yes, absolutely. That's a, a program that we um, are working on with American Airlines and I think it will actually be a, a big benefit for the city. Um, so the airlines during COVID have significant challenges in hiring pilots and um, ha and their availability to aircraft. And so their ability to fly to connect some of these smaller um, <coughs> regional markets is, is, is greatly diminished. And so um, this, there's a company called Landline that had started a service for United and Sun Country um, in Minneapolis and Denver, where they said, hey, you know, if we have some smaller airports that we can't afford to fly to, what if we ran a bus? Um, and, and the idea is that, that folks um, actually go, at, go to Allentown or Atlantic City Airport, they check in like they're checking in for a flight, they can check baggage, um, and then they're escorted instead of onto a plane, onto a bus. Um, the bus, when it gets to Philadelphia, will be able to go right to um, airside and connect those passengers on to planes that will take them to their ultimate destination. Baggage is handled by American, um, you know, really across the board. So, so we think it's it's a great way to connect some of those closer in markets 
um, to Philadelphia and give them access to the transatlantic service that American provides and, and the, the really uh, robust domestic service as well. Well, it's, it's good to hear. I was a little concerned about what that would mean. I know there's about, it's a lot about the business and the connecting flights that, as you mentioned, are hard to, uh, to hard to staff. And I'm glad to see some of that, that creativity as it relates to that, right? We, we want to make sure that Philadelphia's international airport continues to be a premier airport, you know, and I know that our competition is really Baltimore and, and New York, right? Um, <clears throat> but to the extent that we're working with these local smaller airports, I think that's a good thing for us, right, in terms of drawing people in, particularly as conventions get up and going. So thank you very much for, the, for that response and putting on the record. I, I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Councilman Jones, for reminding me how hard the work is at the airport. I know that I can never walk through an airport without saying thank you to as many people as possible. <laughs> um, you know, we spend a lot of time there and we appreciate um, you in particular uh, as the director who really worked through us through some very, very trying times. And um, I'm very happy that we got to a better place and, and that, um, you know, we're we're a premier uh, airport as we should be. So thank you very much. Look forward to the whole charter change, you know, the whole conversation about how do we continue to elevate the airport um, as a regional hub, um, not only for Philadelphia. Thank you so very much. Thank you to everyone. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, so member, Council yeah. President Clark, I apologize. I had to jump off for a call. Oh, no problem, sir. Yeah, Chair recognizes Councilman Squilla. Thank you, Council President, and uh, thank you, uh, Shelley and team, for uh, being on here. I heard a lot of the questions that uh, we've had previously, and I, I appreciate all your answers and willingness to work through it. Um, not sure if I heard this question, but you know, as we talk about bringing back travel, and um, you know how travel has been stunned, especially uh, overseas travel and international travel. Um, what ways are we are we looking to attract international travel back to the airport and how are we engaging that? That's a really good question, Council Member Squilla. Um, so we are very excited that a program that we put into place during COVID um, has had some successes. We called it CASRIP, the COVID Air Service um, recovery initiative program. I think, I think I got that right. I see I'm, I'm reading Tracy's lips as I'm speaking, but, um, we essentially provided incentives to airlines to bring back service that they had, um, pre COVID and, and particularly international service. And this summer we will have, um, service to, um, I believe 12, um, European markets and the Caribbean and Mexico markets are doing very well. Um, I'd like to turn to Kate Sullivan um, of our revenue department to um, talk a little bit more about international travel. Thank you, Shelley, and thank you for that question, Council Member. Uh, I'm Kate Sullivan. I'm the Deputy Director of Strategic Partnerships, and I'm going to expand a little bit on, on what Shelley just laid out. So this summer, is looking better for us than the previous two summers have. We are well up from 2020 and 2021. However, we are still down a little bit compared to July of 2019. July of 2022 for international travel will be about 17.2% down in terms of seats. Destination-wise, that means we're serving about 10 fewer destinations, so 37 international destinations compared to 47 that year. Uh, but we are very excited to be having 12 of our transatlantic destinations return, and those are going to be served across four carriers, so American, Lufthansa, British Airways, and Aer Lingus. And that traffic for us is really important because it doesn't just serve our community, but it also brings connecting traffic through Philadelphia, revenue-wise, and to experience our, our region for the first time often. One bright spot that we really want to highlight uh, from the last couple of years has actually been the growth and recovery of the Caribbean and Mexican markets for us. Uh, so that is not only the leisure traffic that has been referred to throughout this, this hearing, but also it serves our community and community visiting friends and relatives in both destinations. Uh, in particular, we saw the launch of a new flight to Santiago in the Dominican Republic that has been successful over the course of the pandemic. So in addition to that, 
COVID, the CASRIP COVID Air Service uh, and Recovery Incentive Program that Shelley mentioned, uh, which will continue and will focus on bringing bringing back and bringing new qualifying routes to PHL. We're also consistently meeting with our carriers. We're consistently meeting with destinations, including on-site meetings and, and going to conferences where we can meet with stakeholders to talk about the ways in which being having a more robust presence at Philadelphia could help them. Thank you. I know you had mentioned this earlier um, and that do we see bringing those flights back to with a long-term parking challenges. Did you see that as a challenge or no? Well, the specifically with international, um, we have a, a fair amount of connecting traffic that goes on those transatlantic routes. Uh, and that audience specifically doesn't park at the airport. Um, but obviously, you know, we are always looking at the different ways that we can best ensure the passengers use PHL for their international travel. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, as an aside question, and I know you guys have been um, hailed for the work you've done. I know from the re refugees from Afghanistan as they came in uh, and how how you manage that. Uh, can you give us a sense of um, how many refugees came through uh, PHL, some what the challenges were? And are we looking to do anything similar with Ukraine? Thank you for that question. Um, so we were able to help about 30,000 refugees from Afghanistan, which is very significant. Um, those folks came in uh, Philadelphia on about 330 flights. Um, the, the bulk of the work happened during the first two weeks. Um, that operation kicked off at the end of August of last year, and it was finally called to a close um, on the 1st of March. So we were so proud to be able to help those folks. Um, settle in the United States. Many of them um, were actually actually came through the airport twice. We only counted them once, but they actually came through the airport twice. They came in on a, a flight from one of the lily pads and then went out on another flight to their ultimate um, place to live in the United States. Some stayed here, but many went out to other places. So again, we were very excited to be able to, to support that operation. Um, and as a as a veteran myself, it was a big deal to be able to help people who had helped our troops um, while they were overseas. Um, we have n received nothing about um, providing support for Ukrainian refugees at this point. Um, we're always kind of standing by, but um, from what we understand, all refugee flights and, and processing so far is being handled in Washington. DC. And so, you know, we're, we're here if called upon, but we haven't heard anything yet. Well, I'm sure it'd be easier to stand it up if it needs to be done. You did it before. And uh, I think it is uh, very appreciative uh, of not only uh, the people who are coming here, but I think as a city to be proud of uh, how we participate and how we help folks that are in need. So uh, we really thank you for that. Thank you for all the hard work that is being done there. And thank you for continuing to open lines of conversation as we go through our processes here and, and work with not only um, uh, the challenges at the airport, but uh, with our workers and, and so forth and so on. So uh, looking forward to having continued conversations. Thank you. And and you mentioned the other, um, there were 70 agencies that supported us on the Afghan refugee operation. Um, the Office of Emergency Management, Police Department, Fire Department, Department of Health within the city and many more. Um, it truly, truly was a team effort. Thank you for those comments. Thank you. Good, Councilman. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Councilman. Um, we're going to move into our second round, and the chair recognizes Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Council President. Uh, I wanted to quickly circle back to the last question I had in the last round uh, for Oppie relative to uh, sort of how the airport is incorporating sustainability um, in the projects that they are seeking to, to move forward with. Of course. Uh, good afternoon again, uh, Council Member. So I'll talk about climate resiliency because um, I talked a little bit about sustainability and I'll talk about a couple of other initiatives that we have going on. So in terms of climate resiliency, we conducted a climate vulnerability assessment in 2019 and we're in the process of uh, completing a climate adaptation and resiliency plan 
as well as a sustainability management plan, both of which were working uh, together with uh, the Office of Sustainability's office, making sure that any initiatives uh, and recommendations that we uh, we come to the conclusion as we come to the conclusion of these plans, they're in alignment with the city's goals as well because we want to make sure that you know we, we're, we're in alignment with those goals. Um, we just completed uh, an electrification, a vehicle and equipment electrification plan. So let me move into electrification, another important factor in terms of sustainability. Um, and we just completed that literally a month ago. And uh, I yeah. apologize for interrupting, but can I ask you within that plan, does yeah. that include additional EV infrastructure as you all build out at the airport, both for internal and external users? Absolutely. So okay. uh, w there was a lot of positive revelations in that report that I, I, I want to uh, talk about a little bit is that 22% of our current ground support equipment is electric vehicles right now. We have over 200 charging stations that at PHL that we've converted over the years for uh, DOA as well as airline ground support equipment. And with this electrification plan that we just wrapped up uh, last month, our plan is to convert additional uh, parking positions and add additional charging stations in a strategic way. So we have short-term, medium, and long-term plan. We know that you know this is something that uh, is of interest to not just us, but our travelers and the public. And so we want to make sure that we accommodate their needs in the future. So um, I can send you additional information in writing um, if you're interested that kind of lays out our vision and our plan to how we're going to move towards electrification. Okay, that'll be great. And then in addition to that, could you also include all of the sustainability efforts that are currently happening uh, at the airport? Uh, quickly, I just wanted to mention for the record, because I heard my colleague, Councilmember Dom, talk about uh, the need for us to, um, you know, help you all with I guess you could say marketing and ensuring that we have more conventions coming to Philadelphia so folks are utilizing the airport. And I'm certainly uh, happy and hopeful that uh, my dear sorority, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, will help with that uh, July 18th through the 24th of this year when we'll have our international conference uh, here in Philadelphia. And we are anticipating members from around the world, uh, not just around the country, to be here in our city. So I'm hopeful that we can help uh, towards those efforts. I wanted to just quickly ask an additional question relative to your staffing um, and levels of vacancies. And uh, if you could just for me focus specifically on city employees. And so how many employees uh, are currently uh, in service, meaning how many class 100 positions do you currently have filled um, and how many vacancies do you currently have and, and where are they within the airport structure? Great question. I'm going to ask um, our CAO, Delisha Wilds, to address your question. Good afternoon, Councilwoman. Um, my name is Delisha Wilds, Chief Administrative Officer. Um, great question. So we are currently at a little bit over 600 employees. Um, we're looking to hire in the upcoming months as quickly as possible, um, somewhere between 100 and 150 positions um, of civil service positions, and then another uh, 20 exempt positions. Okay, I, I heard the bell, so I'm going to honor the clock and not come back. But the question for the vacant positions, where are they within service um, in the airport? And I mentioned that only because I think Councilmember Jones had quickly talked about, you know, all of the additional challenges that you all face relative to um, the uh, houseless population um, at the airport in 2020. And then also, um, you know, I think we were taking in a number of uh, refugees at some point um, throughout either 2021 or, or early 22. And so just to ensure that we have enough, you know, adequate staff on the ground in the airport throughout, um, you know, the evening and night shifts to sort of deal with some of the other unanticipated challenges that we may have. The staffing is, is throughout our organization. So there are some people that are, are frontline workers as well as throughout the ranks. So it's really all over. We have a lot of vacancies. So okay. Throughout. Okay, and so if you could, if you could just send me a list of, of all the vacancies, that would Absolutely. be exceedingly helpful, and then we can go from there. Thank you, Council President. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilwoman. Chair recognizes Councilwoman Parker. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and and we thought that people 
outside of government government weren't paying attention to our hearings. Um, Shelly, I'm going to ask you to go back just for the record, because while you had given your explanation, I got a text message afterwards in regards uh, to these uh, ever changing and fluid COVID rules. And I, I explained to someone that you just very clearly laid out that if you are walking in the airport or in the airport, you are required to wear your mask. However, as it relates to the court ruling, when you get um, on your airline carrier, when you get on the plane, you make the choice or the decision about whether or not you wear your mask. Did I correctly summarize what you stated, Shelley, for the record? Yes, ma'am. And, and you can uh, do messaging for us if you'd like. All right. Now I need you to answer the second question they just asked me. Um, well, Sherelle, if I am in the Philadelphia airport and someone, passengers, if people are in there and they are not wearing their mask, whose job is it to enforce the city's mask mandate? And I say, I don't know the answer to that question. Let me ask. So, um, we have we have asked empl our employees and other employees to remind passengers to to please mask up. Um, we have announcements um, and and uh, signs throughout the airport that talk about the mandate. We give out free masks, and ultimately, if if there's a a, a really bad situation, the Philadelphia police um, force that is here at the airport can help to enforce and, and take care of um, disruptions. So I would be accurate if I, I, I said to that person, listen, um, airport employees are encouraged to very gently remind uh, you know, folks in our airport that they should wear their mask. Um, if it's anything sort of extensive or complex, um, then we, they call on the police department. But as of today, it is the responsibility of our Philadelphia International Airport employees to, um, to you know, communicate with our users that uh, they should be wearing a mask. Yes, and, and you heard about how we're down 25% in terms of our employees, so we don't have a lot of employees to help with mask enforcement. So again, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can with information counters and just, just trying to remind folks. But um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, um, there are a lot of people who, who are, are choosing not to wear masks right now. It's, it's a very difficult situation. Right. And as is the, the changing and understanding what the rules are. So um, I will concur. Let me ask, also ask you to just quickly go back, if you will. Uh, when you talked about leisure travel is up, um, but you talked about to those destination uh, places, right? Beaches and mountains, and we get it, not the cities. Uh, you talked about a lack of uh, conventions and a lack of international travel. Is there uh, any industry-wide data available, sort of why cities in particular, when you talk about the large ones, um, any data sort of inferring or any correlation to, to why as it relates to cities, any industry um, sort of direction there? I'm just uh, interested in knowing if you've seen, um, you know, any reporting on that issue. Um, I, I've, I've seen a little bit. Um, I don't know how extensive it is. What we can do is provide to you and your office what information we have um, after after the hearing. Yeah, I'd be interested in knowing what the, the explanations were. In addition to that, I wanted to know about the interagency planning and development. Um, I got a, you know, we all love Philadelphia um, and we get a little uh, protective of our turf. And in the midst of COVID, um, I was um, a little frustrated by uh, seeing um, other uh, cities um, and places in our region heavily marketing. Um, you know, come visit this place or come visit that place. And I thought, wow, they're dominating our our media market and, you know, trying to encourage our folks to, you know, travel to their cities. Are we working in an interagency way, airport, visit Philly, convention center, like like what sort of interagency, intergovernmental planning and development is happening? We work extensively with both of those organizations. Um, we think that the, the tie to how we market ourselves as a city is absolutely um, 
essential to, to driving our air travel and, and that tourism market that you talked about. I sit on the PHL CVB board of directors um, and, and we're involved with them um, for the international um, marketing in particular. And then Visit Philadelphia, um, we do a lot of data sharing um, and, and collaborative work on, on trying to target their efforts towards specific airlines and destinations that we're trying to promote, as well as promoting Philadelphia as a whole. Any COVID specific sort of direct planning that you all have, have worked on, or you're talking about sort of you're just consistent working, working together? Um, it, it, it is consistent, but COVID specific, um, we really had to pivot from some of the international destinations and, and look a little bit differently at how we promoted that work. Um, and we, we've really refocused our efforts during COVID um, a lot tighter on, spe again, specific markets that we felt were viable. So um, it's, it's really been more of a pivot and, and as well as a sustained effort. Got it. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Shelly, and your team. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councilwoman. Um, Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson, were you have you concluded your questions? Yes, I have, Mr. President, uh, and thank you so uh, much for checking. No, nah, I just wanted to you know you like come back on those rounds. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yes, thank you. So. Uh, it appears that we have no additional questions for this particular panel. Uh, Councilman Jones, Chair recognize Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll be brief. Um, where are we at with the leases to the various airlines? So it's it's one standard use and lease agreement that all the airlines sign. Um, our current agreement expires on the 30th of June of this year. Um, we've exercised all of the available options. So we have been working diligently with the airlines on a new use and lease agreement. Um, it's been going relatively well. We, we do believe that we're going to be able to agree upon business terms for an agreement, and then it would have to come to council for approval. So can you give, without jeopardizing the deal, are there any heads up that we need to have any particulars? I mean, I know the price of fuel is going up for them. What, so does that impact the terms of the lease that we will approve? Um, not necessarily. Um, it, it does indirectly because it increases their costs. And one of the, the themes that, that we have heard throughout the negotiations is that they, you know, as it's been said in this hearing, um, the travel industry has been particularly hard hit by COVID and the airlines as, as well. Um, so, you know, they're the price of fuel, not really, but, you know, we are talking about things like like term and what capital projects are approved um, as, you know, that would that would come in with the lease. Um, it, as you may remember, um, a lot of times there there's a pre-approval given in the lease for capital projects, sometimes in in the hundreds of millions of dollar range. So we're trying to negotiate through those things. Um, and and you know again fingers crossed that we'll be able to come to business terms so if our fingers are crossed but they but it doesn't happen anyway what what does that mean to all of us so um so if we're unable to get it finished um and passed by um council in this term we would um, have to have a way to continue to charge the airlines and operate the airport. And so we would go to rates by regulation, hopefully just for a very short period of time um, that would allow us to get to where we could get ultimately get an agreement, um, a new lease passed. So with that in mind, and your hope is that we will review and pass at least, when do you think we are going to see our first blush of that agreement? Well, um, I, I wish I could say, um, but I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. We've had um, negotiation sessions over the last couple of weeks. I would hope that that's with that it's by the middle of May. 
um, if if we don't have terms um, negotiated at that point, we're going to need to move forward with the rates by regulation just as a backup, just in case. But again, um, we would hope that it would be by the middle of May so that we could get it introduced and, and leave enough time for full passage before um, your session expires this time. What is the rev, uh, revenue differential between doing it under its current terms and conditions and going that alternative route of rates? The rates by regulation, what we would do, especially if um, if negotiations are going well, everybody is is kind of engaging and in good faith, um, we would establish rates to be very similar to what they are, what they would be under an agreement. So there really wouldn't be a differential. If over time, um, period of months, um, we were unable to, to successfully negotiate and pass a lease, then we would have to look at um, potentially adjusting the rates to um, to better manage the risk, the increased risk that would come to the city by not having an agreement. And how many airlines are we talking about? Um, it's it's all of the airlines. So at, what at is the all? So, uh, how many is that? Go ahead. How many is that? Um, I think it's 26, 27, something along those lines. Can you get that information to the president, please? Absolutely. I'd rather start that review as early as possible. Um, it, it, it relates to the viability of our region. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilman. Um, are there any other questions by members of the committee for these witnesses? There being none, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I uh, look forward to continuing to have these fruitful conversations as we move towards enhancing the airport of the city of Philadelphia. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Council President. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, next up, we have fleet management. All right, and our next witness is Mr. McDermott. Joseph Rosati, Commissioner of Fleet Services. And good afternoon or good, close to good evening. Um, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Council President Clark and distinguished members of the City Council. I am Joseph Rosati, Commissioner for the Department of Fleet Services. Joining me today are Dr. Kay Wilson, Deputy Commissioner for Administration, and John DeLeo, Deputy Commissioner for Operations. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony in support of FY23 operating budget requests for the Department of Fleet Services. The Department of Fleet Services FY23 general fund budget request is $58.5 million, which is $1.32 million less than FY22 estimated obligations. FY23 operating budget request includes 20.51 million in class 100, 5.4 million in class 200, and 32.5 million in class 3 and 400. In FY23, DFS completed, well, in, in FY23, DFS will complete 30 years of its high school internship and apprentice program. Since the program's inception in 1993, DFS has enrolled 134 high school students into the program. 109 have graduated, and 66 of these graduates have accepted permanent civil service positions with the city. In FY23, DFS plans to hire nine high school students into the internship program. This program has enabled DFS to reduce the racial disparity among our automotive technical staff. Historically, 88% of the interns were hired from minority groups. The Department of Fleet Services has 321 dedicated employees who work diligently to provide safe and reliable vehicles and equipment to the operating departments to better service the residents of the city of Philadelphia. You have my detailed written testimony and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much. Um, just got a couple of quick questions. I'm actually not going to ask you about the uh, high school internship because I know uh, at least 
one or two of my colleagues want to get in, in depth. They've been referencing that for quite some time over a number of years. So I'm going to leave that one alone. But I am obviously very interested in that program. Um, but I want to ask you a question about vehicles. Um, I can recall a few years ago, uh, we were actually having a conversation about whether or not we we would switch our vehicles over to natural gas when we were having a discussion around PGW and LNG and all the other things. Will we convert our vehicles? And now the conversation is pretty much centering around electric vehicles, uh, pretty much worldwide. Um, what where where are we at, and what's the thought, and what's the perspective of your department and the policymakers in terms of us moving ahead? Um, and, and will we move ahead with the ultimate transformation, um, transition, I'm sorry, to elect all electric vehicles in the city of Philadelphia? So uh, short term, um, cars and light trucks, we want to we want to create a zero emission situation for cars and light trucks. So we want to replace the cars and light trucks with, with electric vehicles, with EVs, battery electric vehicles. Um, uh, long term, you know, we would like to move that to heavier equipment. Right now, there's not really too many viable heavy heavy equipment options for electric vehicles. There are some manufacturers that are coming out with um, electric heavy duty trucks, but um, there's nothing that I would I would I would make a run at right now. Uh, the the EVs that are being built, the cars and light trucks that are being built uh, right now by the manufacturers. Uh, they look like they'll work, and they're, they look they look like to be reliable. So we're going to move forward with them. And uh, the vehicles are being built faster than probably we can catch up with our infrastructure. So, you know, there's two types of charging stations. There's the there's the type two, which is the overnight slow charge, um, which we have uh, uh, we have them all over the city right now, and um, we have about we have 83 uh, uh, plug-in electric vehicles right now, so we 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 got a running start with 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 doing this because we've been doing this for for quite a few years. Uh, about nine percent of our fleet is is alternative fuel. We have 27 CNG uh, trash compactors. Um, we have 474 HEVs, which are the hybrid electric vehicles. So that's a that's a traditional ice engine vehicle, but it has a, it's also battery powered as well. Okay. So so the long term long short term is we're, we we want to have a zero emissions situation with you know all our small vehicles, and long term we have to find a solution for the heavy equipment. Uh, if it's electric, we'll do that. If it's something else, we'll do that. We're, you know, right now we do have trash trucks that are in operation and working very well. CNG, uh, compressed natural gas tra trash compactors. All right. So let me ask you about your smaller vehicles. I actually saw one up. I think you have some a couple of charging stations up on Glenwood Avenue at the uh, sanitation yard up mm -hmm. in North Philly. I saw the cars plugged in. Uh, is it in terms of the infrastructure, and you referenced this, because I think that everybody that's thinking about possibly making the transition are concerned about the infrastructure, probably the most charging stations in the public. Uh, it's pretty much Tesla. Unfortunately, I understand that there's not the capability uh, to have uniform connections or universal connections that Tesla makes uh, charging stations that can accommodate their cars, um, can't accommodate other cars. I think that's somewhat selfish, but, you know, who am I, right? Um, in the city of Philadelphia, as we convert, would we look at building out our own infrastructure as it relates to charging stations, or will we do vehicles that would be able to be accommodated by private charging stations? How, how will we do that? So our, our, as far as charging infrastructure goes, we're working on um, installing slow charging uh, capabilities, which we've already been doing. and. Uh, we uh, currently we do not have fast chargers. The fast chargers are the charging stations that you see popping up all over the city, EVgo, uh, ChargePoint, you know, and some other others. Um, you'll you see the Tesla charging stations. The Tesla charging stations we can't use those because it's strictly for a Tesla vehicle. The plug is different. 
Right. Um, so, you know, the majority of the vehicles being built are, are being built with an SAE um, uh, plug, which is a J1772 plug. So that so so that plug is 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 prevalent for all the external charging, uh, fast charging. So what I plan to do is I plan to get contracts for fast charging so that we can keep on moving until we get our fast chargers installed at our fueling sites. Okay. Which will take which will take some time. So it's going to take us some time to get our fast charging infrastructure in place. But in the meantime, I'm looking to to use external charging, you know, wherever we can. Yeah, because in order to keep that... our worst vehicles going. All right. Do you have a sense of the time frame? I mean, I know it's hard to speculate. I'm assuming that would be a capital budget item. Yeah. So I, I had a I had gotten a quote for one fast charger to be installed. Um, and it was about ninety thousand dollars. That's just for one fast charger. So you know we would need you know we would need them all over the city, and you know we 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 need our own charging infrastructure for for emergency management reasons as well. You know we need our own secured uh, charging infrastructure for our city vehicles for our emergency vehicles when they do become electric. You know. Wow, ninety thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah, so it's going to take us some time and, and and funding, of course, to 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 get this going. Not to mention, you can't even get your hands on a charger, uh, whether it's a slow charger or a fast charger. They're getting all everybody's buying them up. Yeah, yeah, and I mean it, the vehicles are are transitioning. I mean, I saw a uh, a SUV Mustang the other day, an electric SUV Mustang. I got to tell you, it looked pretty slick and was moving pretty fast. Um, you know, but it didn't make any sound. So I was like, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. a car guy. So I like that sound. <laughs> the like, Mustang has, I think, a range of like 250 miles. Okay. Um, and I think you can, I think you can purchase like an extra, a larger battery with the vehicle to make it go about 300 miles. But, yeah. Uh, the, 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 we just purchased a work van for free library and it has a range of 126 miles. And, you know, the average city work vehicle probably it doesn't go drive more than 47 miles. So these these vehicles with with a range over 100 miles, if you have a full charge and you charge your vehicle overnight uh, at your depot, wherever you work at, you shouldn't have any problem using these things. Even even as far as, um, you know, the general public. I mean, if they're charging them at their houses, you know, they're charging them overnight. If, if they don't if they don't travel hundreds of miles, the vehicle will be fine. Yeah. Our CNG for our larger vehicles, where, where do we access that, the, the compressed national gas for our vehicles? So in southwest Philly uh, at 63rd Street, the sanitation yard, we build a CNG fueling site there. And uh, currently we have 27 uh, compressed natural gas compactors. I think there's three on order that's, that we're going to be taking delivery of soon. And we're going to order three more for FY23. Uh, so that'll bring us up to 33. But that fuel site can can handle 70 trucks. So wow. I could I so you know as time goes on, we're going to want to expand that fuel site and 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 change that entire depot, that sanitation depot, over to compressed natural gas. Wow. Okay, that's awesome. Um, uh, let's ask you all the questions I have for you, sir. Um. I'm going to turn it over to Councilwoman Parker. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and uh, good afternoon to you, Joe Rosati. Let me uh, start by uh, saying um, a special thank you to Matt uh, Duignan. If I chopped up your name, Matt, don't you get upset with me. And Robert Comitalo Jr. Robert uh, and Matt have uh, been extremely helpful to me uh, in my office. And uh, I wanted to just uh, say a special thank you to them uh, for the record. Um, I want to uh, ask a question um, that we asked of the uh, the airport council president did relative to the charter change. Um, I was happy to put forward the uh, the legislation 
legislation, uh, creating a new uh, Department of Fleet Services for the city. The legislation was passed and um, and it was adopted as a, a ballot question. And along the same lines of what was asked of the airport, can you just give us a brief overview of the changes to the charter and what benefits you see coming to the city as a result of it? So, you know, since, um, thank you for the question. Um, si since Fleet was a, a an office, it was uh, it was created as an office by an executive order by um, then Mayor Ed Rendell. Uh, so we, we, and we operated as a, as a department, as a department would for many years, but we just didn't have the title. Um, but uh, the, <clears throat> The benefit of it is, is that we can we we can never be, um, uh, you know, uh, canceled or disbanded or 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 uh, de uh, decentralized. Uh, being centralized, having the fleet centralized into into one organization, you know, with automotive professionals running it, um, is 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 cost effective and and productive for the city, and it allows us to move move forward and. Uh, and implement these uh, changes that need to be made, especially with the electric vehicle and the clean fleet initiative. So the economic uh, benefit and then uh, from a policy per perspective um, and sort of the charging stations and the electric vehicles that you just described, that's just uh, important so uh, that uh, members of the, the viewing public clearly get that. Because um, I'm mindful of what you said, Council President, on the record that you're no stranger to charter changes, but we want them to know we did it for a reason. Right. So thank you sort of for getting that explanation uh, on the record for us. Um, also, relative to the, the workforce development program, um, the only comment that I want to make to you um, about this is that you've been demonstrating that it is possible for us to work directly with our school district of Philadelphia to develop a pipeline um, into uh, the department um, of, of, of fleet services. And uh, Mr. President and, uh, and, and Whip Jones, uh, are you just the two that I, that I see? I think Council Member Sanchez and Gilmore Richardson is still here. Um, if people are ever questioning how we establish a model that's effective, um, we we don't need to like look outside of us. We 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 know how to do it um, because we see a department that's actually uh, getting it done and has has grown. Started in one place, um, but now uh, is moving. I think you said 109 graduates. Is that the stat that you gave? So uh, my hope is that um, as we think of um, our workforce uh, retiring um, and, and trying to deal with the attrition and um, uh, more workers um, feeling empowered and, and, and having different kinds of opportunities, that we, we would think of this route as the route to sort of fill the pipeline. Um, so with that, um, Mr. President, thank you so very much. And uh, Joseph, thank you so very much for your response today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilwoman. Uh, excuse me. Chair recognizes Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I've been around long enough now that I've been through one or two budget sessions. What I appreciate about Fleet is they actually hear and respond the last time I checked, one third of your workforce came through uh, CTE programs in Philly. What is that stat today? Um, I don't have that information in front of me. Dr. K, do you have that uh, number? Yes, uh, as a, uh, my name is K. Wilson, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, as a Commissioner mentioned earlier, uh, we have 134 high school students who came through the program and uh, 109 graduated and 66 of them are uh, enrolled to the city's permanent civil service position. And out of that, 33 employees are still with the uh, 
uh, fleet in very various capacities, uh, starting from the techni apprentices, technicians, team leaders, supervisors, and one of them who came through the program is uh, now uh, promoted to the district manager. So this is a successful, successful program which we are carrying for the last 30 years. So when we started bringing this up, President Clark, a while back, they really listened. And so when I go through Randolph uh, Technical School up on Henry Avenue, and I see these young men and women working under the hood, working in body shops, working on catalytic converters, working on transmissions, they do so with a sense of purpose, knowing that they've got a career at the end of that rainbow, somewhat in part because of the city's uh, motor vehicles and fleet department. It, it, I cannot tell you how satisfying that is to see young people that want, you gotta kick them out of school. You, they don't want to leave. They wanna work on their project. They work on people's cars that bring them in. They work on their own vehicles. And there is a sense of pride and purpose that they, that you guys give them. And, um, and they know this stuff. So I, I just want to thank you. Um, I want to thank you for always. I've been in one or two city cars. I'll never forget. Uh, I was on the, uh, Roosevelt Boulevard Expressway Press. And I started feeling that power loss in the pedal. I pulled over, thank, thank, thank God. And it didn't take long for Fleet to come swap it out and deal with it. I would dare to say you're better, better than AAA. I'd rather have you than AAA. And that's a fact. So I want you to know I appreciate you, I see what your department does, uh, and I appreciate it totally. So just just to add a little bit onto that, um, we we have a recruitment team, and they 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 visit the schools. Um, and one of the, one of the recruiters is one of my district managers, who 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 was an high high school intern. So I mean, you know, we 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 can show that you know, if you want to come come and work for us and stay the course. You know, there's opportunity to climb our career ladder. You know, the, the high school interns are holding every position in my organization, in our organization right now, uh, and, you know, except for a deputy and commissioner position. You know, the, the, we have a district manager. We have a, a, a shop supervisor. We have five team leaders, you know, and a, a bunch of technicians that all came from the program. So if anybody... Wants to come and 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 come work for Fleet, you know. We'll we'll welcome you. And uh, there's a there's a, we have examples. There's there's opportunity here, Mr. President. There's been talk about a school to prison pipeline. Fleet has created a school to paycheck pipeline. There you go. That's what we're talking about. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Yeah, thank you, thank you, hey, Mr. Rosali. Um, real quick. Um. I think it was on Walnut. I visited a school a few years back where they were working on vehicles um, out West Philadelphia. Um, they were doing other things and they were actually making vehicles. Does that have any relationship with the city? Or is it just... Yeah. You You know what I'm talking about? I think it was out around 40-something 40, 40 in Walnut or 50-something in Walnut. So, that, so the, the schools that, that have participated in the program and still do some of these schools uh, one of these schools i know is closed but uh you have the workshop school west philadelphia school high school uh swenson simon gratz randolph mass bomb king edison buck and Auden reed i would probably think it would be west philadelphia it's west philly yeah yeah, yeah. and I, they had these young folks in there the councilman was saying they were so excited and they actually one of the projects that they built a vehicle uh, themselves and they were they were really excited about that and you could just see it in their eyes like oh they couldn't wait to get engaged so yeah this, this just, type of turning stuff. turning wrenches this type of career you got to want to do it you got to love it um 
and, and 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 you know, listen. Some of the kids that come through, you know, uh, they 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 you know use us as a stepping stone to to move on to other careers. Some of them left us and became firefighters, you know. Um, but you know, it's all good. They you know they 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 learned something from us. They got some life experience. Um, maybe they found out that they didn't like working on vehicles uh, for you know for for uh, for the rest of their life. But um, West Philly. They had 25 kids we had come through there. Randolph had 32 uh, kids came through, and Edison, 32. They were the biggest biggest numbers, those three schools. Oh, awesome. just, to add, just to add with that, uh, you know, there are kids who came through the program and motivated through the program, uh, even went to the colleges for automotive engineering programs. And, uh, you know, we accommodated them, their schedules, and uh, we arranged their uh, work schedule to accommodate their college uh, courses. And, uh, you know, yeah. we were very glad that we, they're moving into the automobile engineering courses uh, through this, you know, by taking motivation through this program. Right. Awesome. Okay, um, Chair recognizes Councilwoman Monona Sanchez. Thank you, uh, Council President Clark and my colleagues, and thank you to the whole fleet management team for always being incredibly responsive um, um, throughout the years and just your team. You know, you guys are available 24 hours a day, and we appreciate you um, every single day. I want to go back to the line of question Council President Clark had around the EVs, and I know that Council Member Squilla and O and others, you know, I've talked to Council uh, Member Gilmore Richardson. How involved are you in conversations with our public property department about building out some of these charging stations in publicly owned land? Uh, so right now we're in the process of um, the MDO is in the process of um, creating a, a clean fleet committee and um, the the big departments uh, would be involved would be pu public property uh, you know water you know all the all the all the all the uh, if liaisons from the big departments would be in be involved in that clean fleet committee and um, they uh, <clears throat> There would be a, a a a manager, like an infrastructure manager that would that would handle 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 the uh, you know hiring vendors and and creating uh, capturing funding for for the for the infrastructure. So yeah, the answer to your question is public property will be involved in all that. It's really important. I think that you know whether you listen to um, Secretary Buttigieg. Buttigieg or others, you know, this is the time. This is the time, and we have to be as proactive as possible as we build out this infrastructure and whatever publicly held land we have. Right? Obviously, the ones that are in use, but even vacant land. Right? I think if we're going to have equity in building out a structure, I think it's important that the sooner um, we start looking at where what neighborhoods are traditionally overlooked. Right. Um, I know that we did some research um, in preparation. You know, we were looking to to ask the administration to come up with an EV infrastructure plan. Um, you know, a lot of cities ended up in parking lots and other places because they were built out. We are not. So we really have an opportunity in every neighborhood to create um, this infrastructure. And and so I'm, I'm glad to hear that you guys are being uh, proactive uh, around um, some of this, uh, some of this work. What what is the cost related to like building out some of these independent structures? And how would you see if anything, as you talk to your counterparts in other cities, you know, because we're such a dense city, how, how do you see some of this stuff rolling out? Because it's not only for our fleet trucks, right? Because we want to be able to make sure that as we build out our fleet, but just for for general public utilization. So, um, as far as as far as uh, building it out for for public consumption, I wouldn't be involved in that. Um, the, the the charging stations that that I would be involved in would be uh, the stuff that would be secured um, behind locked gates, you know, okay. and things like that. But um, that is uh, th there's there's a lot of external. Um, opportunities for charging right now. Uh, I believe that EVgo and ChargePoint, you're starting to see them pop up all over the city. So I believe residents that want to take advantage of that, you know, are, you know, are like two of my neighbors have 
I have Teslas and I never see the things plugged in. Never. So mm -hmm. I asked them. So I asked them, I said, I never see you plug these cars in. There's, you know, and they said that they don't. They just take it over to the fast charging place, sit there for 15 minutes and charge it. And it lasts them for the vehicle charge lasts them for a few days and they do it again. So they don't even plug it into their house. Wow, that's interesting. Well, so, again, I, I'm, I think I'm, that I think that for the general public, there's going to be plenty of opportunities to 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 use fast charging. They're going to be popping up all over the place. Well, I, again, I think that this is something that we have to plan out as a city, right? And and to the extent that we're having these conversations about public spaces and and ensuring again equity, um, you know, we can't afford tels Teslas right now. But, you know, if some of this infrastructure stuff that the president wants to do comes through, the, you know, and there are, there are these $20,000, $25,000 credits that they're estimating people are going to get for these cars, I want to make sure that there's equity in that infrastructure. And so um, uh, I'm glad that you're part of the conversation. I think you should be part of the broader conversation. How vehicles, how we manage that public process is going to be important. I, I don't know if you've heard some of the hearings we've had around charging stations in South Philly and in Squillis District. People are, this is not, it's going to become ugly unless we figure out the public utilization piece of it because it could become quite challenging. At the same time, we want to encourage it and, and make it uh, readily available. So thank you very much, Council President. Thank you all again to the fleet management team. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, Councilwoman. Um, actually got a text from Councilwoman Parker. The school I referenced is the workshop school located at 221 South Hanson Street in West Philly. It's at 48th and Locust. And with the kids, actually, they built they built vehicles. It's like I, I was just so impressed with what they had. But this is great. This is great. Yeah, they're they're one of the, they're one of the schools we had. We had ten ten students uh, come through our program from the workshop school. Great, great, awesome. Okay, uh, are there any other questions from members of the committee for these witnesses? They're seeing none. Um, I want to thank you, thank you and your team very much for um, your work. Um, thank for what you're doing for these young folks. Um, we need to replicate that in every department in the city of Philadelphia, as was said earlier. It would make a difference. So uh, as we encourage people to hire uh, young Philadelphians, uh, we are, you are setting a real example for what everybody should be doing, both in public and private sector. So we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Uh, that concludes our questions for today. Uh, this committee will stand in recess until 10 a.m. April 20th, 2022, at which time we will reconvene on Microsoft's team. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.